In 4.2, we're going to talk about trig functions and how they relate to the unit circle. But before we even begin doing that, we want to introduce the unit circle. So we talked about it in 4.1, where we <clears throat> kind of looked at a circle and transformed degrees into radians and radians into degrees. Uh, but now let's talk about the points on the circle. So here I have incorporated a little bit of a, a small review, right? So we want to say the equation of the circle is x squared plus y squared equals 1. And that is the equation of a circle that is centered at the origin and it has radius 1. So, what does a circle of radius 1 look like? Well, it looks like any other circle, um, except this circle here has any point away from the center, distance 1. So, if we look at this and think of this as the x and y axis, right, we can say that there is a point here that is on the edge of the circle, and that point is away or has coordinates 1 comma 0. Okay, so those are that's one of the easy ones. Then there's also this point right here on the y-axis, which means I go left and right 0 units, but I go up 1 unit. So 0 comma 1. Here, if I was to go from this point, well, if I was to go from the origin to this point, it would be negative 1 comma zero and this point would be zero comma negative one so the idea is that we're going to connect the equation of a circle which we said was x squared plus y squared equals one into this idea right as you can see <clears throat> all of these points fit this description if I was to, for example, plug in this into this equation, it gives me 1. It comes out to be true. But we're going to create values or be able to come up with values for other points, like this point up here, for example, which comes out to be the square root of 2 over 2 for both x and y. Okay, so for now, just kind of follow along with that, and soon we will be able to understand where those values came from. So that's the idea, right? <clears throat> that we want to be able to come up with those values and understand those points and connect them to the equation of the circle. So now we see the definitions of the trig functions, but in terms of the unit circle. So if, for example, we have this figure on the left side and it's showing us the point negative three over 5 comma negative 4 over 5 and that point is on the unit circle so this length right here this radius is of 1 right and we're wondering if it goes from the point 1 comma 0 and opens all the way around to reach this point right here has a value of t right some random angle then we want to figure out uh, a function that gives us the x value, a function that gives us the y value, and so on. And so here's where the six trig functions come into play. So the first one is sine of t equals y. So t is the argument for the sine function or for any of the trig functions. And it's an angle, 
right? So notice how I put it in parentheses, kind of telling you that that's what I'm inputting into this function. So sine of t is equals to the y value of the point that we're given. Cosine of t is equal to the value of x tangent of t is equal to the, the y value divided by the x value. On the right side we have the reciprocal definitions. So cosecant of t is equal to 1 over y. Then we have secant of t which is 1 over x. And then we have cotangent which is x over y. So those are the six definitions uh, that we're going to be using when referring to the unit circle and figuring out uh, the values for a different point. Okay. Let's do an example now uh, figuring out the different values or figuring out all the different trig definitions that we just went over given this point. So the directions may go something like this and just tells us to find all the or at least find the values of the six trig functions that we talked about. So the first one would be sine. So sine of the argument t we said was equal to the y value. So whatever the y value is, that's what sine of t is equal to. In this case is 8 over 17. <clears throat> the next thing or the next function is cosine of t, which is equals to the x value. So whatever is in the x component is going to be cosine, or the value of cosine. Then, a little bit more interesting is tangent, which is x over y oops, sorry, y over x, and so <clears throat> we do, as we see there, we divide the y value by the x value, okay? So once you carry out that division, you get negative 8, over 15 or just the negative outside in front of the numerical portion okay then we have cosecant and it's equals to 1 over y so I'll just start putting that definition there <clears throat> so it's pretty much the reciprocal of the y value then there is secant of t, which is 1 over x, and the x value is going to be negative 15 over 17, but if you flip it around, you get negative 17 over 15, and the last trig function is cotangent of t, and this one is x divided by y. In this case, we would just divide the x value, which is negative 15 over 17, divided by 8 over 17, in which case the 17s cancel, and we get negative 15 over 8. And so that's how we find the six trig functions <clears throat> for a given point. 
In this set of examples, we're going to look at a different argument uh, as compared to the previous examples where it was sine of t. In this case, we're looking at sine of pi over 6. So this pi over 6 here um, could be in, in parentheses, and it's just telling us that if we make a rotation that has a angle measurement of pi over 6, what is the sine value of it? So, if you recall, uh, sine of whatever the angle is, <coughs> is going to be the y value. So if we look here at our graph, if we go from 1 comma 0 and we go upwards, which is what the arrow is showing us here, or counterclockwise in the standard direction, then we reach this point here and it has the coordinates square root of 3 over 2 comma 1 half. So out of those x and y points we're going to choose whatever corresponds with sine which in this case is going to be 1 half. Okay and so on. So cosine of 2 pi over 3 well, where is 2 pi over 3? Uh, we can use different methods like we've done before. Uh, saying, you know, this is right here uh, 1 pi over 6, 2 pi over 6, 3 pi over 6, 4 pi over 6. And I think if we write it out as 4 pi over 6, it simplifies down to 2 pi over 3 which is what we're looking for so this point right here is what we are looking for in this second example so what is cosine of 2 pi over 3 well whatever is here in the x coordinate which happens to be negative 1 half okay then secant of 11 pi over 6. Well, if you remember, secant of t was equal to 1 over x, right? So, whatever is in the 11 pi over 6 position or angle, we're going to do 1 over the x value of it. So, if we count again, we go almost all the way around to this point right here. So what is in the x? Uh, square root of 3 over 2, but if we do 1 over that, or just the reciprocal of it, we get the following, 2 over the square root of 3, but we cannot have radicals in the denominator. We are going to have to rationalize which means get rid of the, the, the radical that's in the denominator. Uh, I can show you how to do that later, but for now, this becomes the answer. 2 square root of 3, all of that divided by 3. Okay? Then, we're trying to figure out problem D. Tangent of 0, meaning if you don't rotate anything or don't go anywhere, Okay, remember that tangent was y over x. Tangent of t is equal to y over x. So, in this case, uh, we're kind of fortunate since we are here at this point, and we were going to do 0 divided by 1, and 0 divided by 1 is 0. Okay, don't get it confused with undefined. Uh, we are able to define that, which is 0, the value 0. Then there is secant of 5 pi over 3. So where is 5 pi over 3? So <clears throat> let's see. Uh, probably somewhere where both those numbers are twice their value, so go all the way around to 10 pi over 6. If you divide those by 2, you get 
5 pi over 3, which is right here. And secant, we already talked about it above, which is 1 over x. So it'll be 1 over 1 half. So when that simplifies, we get a 2. Then the last one is going to be tangent of 3 pi over 2. So if you're here and you look at it in terms of halves, right? This is 0. This is pi over 2. This is pi. <clears throat> and then this right here is 3 pi over 2. So remember what is the definition of tangent? Tangent is y over x. So what is the y? Negative 1 over 0. Can you divide it by 0? And the answer is no. <clears throat> so therefore tangent at 3 pi over 2 is undefined. Uh, next we want to talk about the properties of the functions sine and cosine. And most importantly, we want to talk about the range and the domain. So if you understand this equation, uh, the y value is equal to sine of some t value, right? Some angle. So uh, functions, right? If you understand how they work, uh, this right here that you're inputting gets processed by the sine function and it gives you an output. So the output is understood as a range <clears throat> and the input is understood as the domain so the angle as you see is inside the circle right so it just goes around 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 and around and the y value goes from zero all the way up to one and then it comes back down it becomes negative and it goes to zero and it just goes around in circles Okay, so the output um, oscillates, right? It kind of it kind of goes from zero all the way up to one, and then from one it goes down to zero, and then from zero to negative one, and it just goes around in circles and repeats. So the big idea here is that it repeats. Then we look at the function cosine, and the same thing. The input is the angle. And that makes up the domain. The output is this value, which we refer to as x. And that is considered the output or the range. Okay. And the same thing, the function uh, is dependent on the angle. So whatever angle you input gives you the x value for cosine. And so as the angle goes around and around and around, it goes from 1 to 0 to negative 1, and it comes back around, so it repeats. Okay, so there's some kind of relationship with this whole repetition, and it only being able to go from 1 to negative 1, and back to 1, and so on. Okay, to complete the previous figures that we had here with the range and domain you know, graphically displayed for sine and cosine, uh, we can say the following, right? We can say that the domain of both sine and cosine is negative infinity to positive infinity, right? Which includes all real numbers. So what it says is that you are allowed to plug in all the real numbers as an argument into the function sine or cosine then you can expect your output or the range to fall between negative 1 and 1 inclusive right so that's why the square brackets because it includes the value negative 1 <clears throat> all the way up to the value positive 1 so what we're going to talk about now is the functions being even or odd. So as you know, we have points on the unit circle. So for example, this point here we're calling P and it's made up of an X and Y. 
but then also that same point is down here. It is the same distance x away from 0, but in this case is negative, so downwards, okay? So something like that is what cosine has as one of its properties. So whatever uh, angle you put in, whether it goes counterclockwise or clockwise, it's going to have the same x value that is away from zero. So the cosine value is going to be the same. And then the same with the secant, right? So that's even functions. Now everything else is considered an odd function, which is sine, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent. What it means is that if you have a point for example, P, which is made up of X comma Y. Well, that same point over here on the left is going to be negative X comma Y. So it just means same height or same point Y above the origin, but different points of X. Right, it, this point here on the left, it just went left x values and then upwards y values. <clears throat> so what it means for sine and so on is that if you put in negative argument, it's going to be the same thing as multiplying that same argument or evaluating that same argument as a positive but then multiplying it by a negative, okay? So it's a little bit of understanding like where those values are and what the signs of them are, uh, like we saw here on this graphic. So now let's talk about reciprocal identities. Uh, reciprocal identities are the flipped version uh, if you look at it as a fraction, okay? Uh, remember, sine of t is equals to y, but its flipped version, or the 1 over y, also has the definition of 1 over cosecant of t. So, this is what we mean by a reciprocal identity. We are defining sine in terms of another function as a reciprocal of it. So sine of t is the same thing as 1 over cosecant of t. Cosine of t is the same thing as 1 over secant of t. Tangent of t is equal to 1 over cotangent of t. Then cos cosecant of t is the same thing as 1 over sine of t. So this uh, that are across from each other are related right sine is 1 over cosecant well cosecant is 1 over sine secant is 1 over cosine and cotangent is 1 over tangent then on top of these reciprocal identities we need to talk about a couple other things so things like quotient identities So what are they? Uh, they're just functions that are defined in terms of other functions as a quotient. So for example, if you remember tangent, tangent was defined as y over x. But then we also said that y is equals to sine of t. And then x is defined as cosine of t. So therefore, tangent of t is equal to sine over cosine. So that's one of the quotient identities that we need to keep in mind. And so if you connect this information with the reciprocal identities that we just covered, 
Well, you know that cotangent is just the reciprocal of tangent, so therefore, cotangent of argument t is the same thing as cosine of t divided by sine of t. Okay, another identity that we need to know is the Pythagorean identities. So I have put in some information that we kind of already covered, which is the equation of a circle. And it is x squared plus y squared equals one. And this is for a circle of radius one. Uh, I've also included <clears throat> some definitions that are useful in this case, which is the definition of y, which is sine of t, and then the definition of x, which is cosine. So as you can already see, we can change this circle definition. So that is in terms of sine and cosine. So we will have our first Pythagorean identity, which is going to be, you can say cosine square of x or cosine square of t so that it doesn't get confused plus sine square of t equals 1. So that is the first Pythagorean identity. From this one, you can build all the other ones. Okay, the second one is going to be 1 plus tangent square of t equals to secant square of t. And how do we get this, for example? Well, if you look at the first Pythagorean identity and you divide everything by cosine square of t, well, cosine square divided by cosine square gives you one, sine over cosine gives you tangent, one over cosine would give you secant. So that's how we come across the second Pythagorean identity. And if instead of dividing the original by cosine, you divide by sine, then you get the following. If you divide by sine, you're going to get cotangent square plus 1 is equal to cosecant square of t. So those three are considered the Pythagorean identities and they all come from mainly the equation of a circle. You plug in x and y, you get the following. You divide everything by either cosine or sine and then you get the other two Pythagorean identities. Periodic functions are a function that just repeats itself uh, when you plug in a specific number. So the definition that we have here is that it is a function or a function is periodic if there exists a number p such that the function and then you plug in the value of p plus some other number gives you back f of t or the function evaluated at the value of t. So it's almost as, as if the value of p <clears throat> doesn't have effect after some, some point, right? So p is then known as the period of f, okay? How do we represent that into the functions that we just talked about? or the functions we learn, which is the trig functions. So for sine and cosine, the idea is that sine evaluated at point t, or the value t, the number t, but then if you add two pi to it, or like a rotation, it gives you back the same value sine of t. So, the same thing with cosine. 
cosine at a value t plus 2 pi is the same thing as the value cosine of t. Okay, the same thing applies to any multiple of 2 pi for both scenarios. So for sine and cosine, we say that 2 pi is the period for those functions. Okay, that's the value p. And I guess I should have perhaps change the original definition that I gave you here so that it matches what we have, which is t plus p. And so now t is the input, but then you're adding p, which is the period here. In this case, it's 2 pi for the functions sine and cosine. Then what about tangent and cotangent? Same thing, you're inputting t, but you're changing or you're adding pi and that should give you and I think I made a mistake here with this right here okay <clears throat> tangent of t plus pi is the same thing as tangent of t so pi is going to be the period of the function tangent. Well, same thing with the function cotangent. Cotangent of t plus pi is the same thing as cotangent of t. Therefore, t, I'm sorry, cotangent has a period of pi, just like tangent. 